Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 35 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Who is your favorite American author? Mine happens to be Washington Irving, who is actually an historian as well. Some historians and biographers have called Washington Irving the first great American author, so I'm not the only person to think so highly of his work. But who was Irving? Why is he important? Today, Michael Lord, Director of Education at Historic Hudson Valley, joins us to explore the life of Washington Irving, his home, Sunnyside, and the historic Hudson Valley region, which Irving immortalized in his stories, such as Diedrich Knickerbocker's History of New York, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and Rip Van Winkle. During our exploration, Michael reveals information about Historic Hudson Valley, a museum of historic sites in Westchester County, New York, particulars about the tenant farmer landholding system of colonial New York, and how that system of landholding differed from other colonial regions in North America, and details about the life of Washington Irving and the important role his literary works have played in how we remember and think about the Hudson Valley region and its history. But first, be sure to tune in until the end of today's episode for a special announcement regarding our summer meetup and stamp act tour in Boston this August. Let's get to our interview with Michael Lord. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Michael Lord is the Director of Education at Historic Hudson Valley, a museum of historic sites that celebrates the history, architecture, and material culture of the Hudson Valley region. Historic Hudson Valley restores, preserves, and promotes historic landmarks of national significance within the Hudson Valley for public enjoyment. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michael. Thanks, Liz. Pleasure to be here. We're excited to have you join us today because in Episode 9, Peter G. Rose piqued our interest about historic Hudson Valley. Peter mentioned that she had learned how to cook several Dutch colonial dishes in the kitchen at Phillipsburg Manor. And this fact surprised me because I know historic Hudson Valley as the caretaker of Sunnyside, the home of Washington Irving. So we really wanted to have you on the show so you could tell us more about historic Hudson Valley and the historic sites it cares for. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to all of this. Would you tell us a bit about yourself and your work at Historic Hudson Valley? Sure. I am uh, currently the Associate Director of Education for Historic Hudson Valley. Now, Historic Hudson Valley is a network of six historic sites here, uh, primarily in Westchester, just north of New York City, with one outlier, oh, about another 40 or 50 miles north of that uh, in a little town called Rhinebeck. We interpret the history of the Hudson Valley, as you would previously said, celebrating really the Hudson Valley here. I've been at Historic Hudson Valley more or less since 1998, helping to run uh, some of the new interpretive programs that we offer here, uh, in addition to uh, the school programs, but also the adult programs, group tours, summer workshops, and professional development as well. You mentioned that Historic Hudson Valley concentrates in Westchester County and the town of Rhinebeck. And I wonder if you could actually tell us about how New York classifies the Hudson Valley, because the Hudson River really runs from its origins in the Adirondack Mountains up in northern New York and goes all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean in the New York Harbor. So how do you define the geography of Hudson Valley? Well, the little section that we primarily focus on here at the historic Hudson Valley is the area known as the Tappan Zee. Now, the Tappan Zee is the widest part of the Hudson. It's as much as four, maybe four and a half miles wide here. Uh, it was named after the uh, the local Tappan Native Americans, part of the Lenape, and Zee being the Dutch word for sea. It was a sort of a wide area here. 
The Tap NZ uh, has a, a lot of mystery sort of surrounding it in terms of odd trade winds and a variety of uh, uh, stories and such. The Hudson, I think, in, in some ways was perhaps in the early years here the most European of rivers. I mean, the town of Rhinebeck uh, was named such because it reminded uh, visitors who had settled there of the Rhine River. Uh, it was very mountainous uh, on both sides of the, the Catskills up there. Uh, and uh, the beautiful meandering river as it works its way down towards New York City. Historic Hudson Valley is not just an organization, but a museum of historic sites. How many historic sites does Historic Hudson Valley care for, and what can we see if we come for a visit? Well, Historic Hudson Valley has six historic sites that it either owns or operates. Uh, and interestingly enough, they sort of play very well in increments of uh, sort of we jump forward every 50 years to get to a new site. Our oldest site, historically speaking, uh, is Phillipsburg Manor. Uh, it was a, a manor that was established here in Westchester around 1685. We interpret it. We sort of set the year there for around 1750. If you jump ahead another 50 years or so to about 1800, we talk about Van Cortland Manor which was a a neighboring provisioning plantation run by the Van Cortland family, where we really get into uh, issues and events surrounding the new nation period, uh, sort of how America invents its own government. Another 50 years ahead of that, around 1850, we're talking about Washington Irving's Sunnyside, home to the only home, in fact, to uh, to our really America's first uh, writer, Washington Irving, at least published author of sorts. Uh, another 50 years or so around there, about 1900, uh, is our uh, site up in Rhinebeck, that is Montgomery Place, where we really discuss the life of numerous families uh, that lived in Montgomery Place, from the Livingstons and the Montgomerys, and really the the women who sort of developed their own sort of environmentalist sort of ethos up there, uh, and jump into the middle of the 20th century with both uh, the Rockefeller estate, Kikit, and also uh, the Rockefeller's own church called the Union Church of Picantico Hills, which is a beautiful church that has windows, stained glass windows made by uh, Henri Matisse uh, and Marc Chagall. Is Montgomery Place the homestead of Richard Montgomery, who had married a Livingston and then died during the Canada expedition in 1775? That is indeed the Montgomery that it is named after. They were, as you can uh, understand, a lot more Livingstons that were sort of up there than Montgomery's. Uh, but it is a, a beautiful architectural uh, manor uh, that sits on the Hudson, uh, overlooking uh, on a hillside, really overlooking the Hudson River. You mentioned that Historic Hudson Valley cares for both Van Cortlandt and Phillipsburg manors, and those were large landed estates in the 18th century. I wonder if you could tell us about the development of the tenant farmer system that emerged in colonial New York and how it worked, because that style of land development was very different than what we would have seen in New England or the southern colonies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Traditionally in New England, everybody were small farm owners, uh, own their own land uh, and work that land. But here in the uh, in, in New York, because of its Dutch roots, I believe, uh, there was a, a system that worked a little bit different here. Under the Dutch rule, we had uh, a patroon-based system where there were large land grants that were given to people like the Rensselaers, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres, in fact, maybe perhaps as much as a million acres farther up the river here. And Obviously, these individuals could not tend to all that land themselves, so they uh, carved out pieces of it and rented that to tenants. That tenant system carried over after English rule takes over in 1664-65. And the Phillipses and the Van Cortlands, they had Dutch roots. They were were Dutch, but they swore their allegiance after uh, the King of England took over. Uh, And they established very large land grants. They were given large land grants as well. 50, 60, 80,000 acres for the Van Cortlands. What they did, because these men were merchants primarily, they lived and worked primarily in uh, New York City, which was the capital and it was also sort of the central part for, uh, for import and export and trade. These men rented their land out to tenant farmers, told those tenant farmers that they had to grow a particular cash crop in this area. This was all wheat uh, in the 18th century, uh, and deliver that wheat to one of their mills where it would be ground into flour and packed and exported primarily down to the sugar islands of uh, Barbados and Curacao to feed enslaved populations growing sugarcane. 
there. So this was part of a world trade operation. Tenant farmers were here to produce the cash crop, and it was these merchants that became landowners and landlords uh, that profited from the system. You mentioned the enslaved population and how merchants like the Van Cortlands and the Phillipses, you know, sent New York grain down to the Sugar Islands to feed the slaves. They worked on this tenant farmer system where they rented out their lands to farmers who would farm and grow the grain. Mm -hmm. Did these families also make use of slave labor? And if so, how? Yes. Um, Of course, the Phillipses and the Van Cortlands and any wealthy landlord or merchant was also a slave owner. Uh, The Phillipses owned upwards of 40 or 50 slaves amongst their family, which was a very large scale for New York. Uh, At Phillipsburg Manor, we know that there were 23 enslaved men, women, and children that worked the core part of that property. The Phillipses rented most of their land out to tenants. They kept four, five, six hundred acres uh, along the core of their property uh, that this enslaved community worked uh, both um, tending to wheat, but also in very skilled positions, such as uh, the mill operation was run by enslaved labor. Uh, riverboat pilots uh, were actually uh, enslaved individuals. Van Cortlands did the same. And interestingly enough, even a number, a fair number of the tenant farmers themselves were able to purchase one or perhaps two uh, enslaved individuals to assist them uh, on their with their farm duties as well. Westchester in the 18th century was about mm, 10% enslaved at that time. New York City was double that, 20%. And uh, the rural area of Brooklyn, Kings County, was more than a third enslaved in the 18th century. It was not a small thing going on up here. When we think of slavery in the United States, our minds tend to drift towards the South, where you'd have a large plantation and slave dwellings and and field hands. We mentioned that some of the slaves knew trades, and some of them worked in the field. But how did they live? Did they live in separate buildings? Did they live with the families? What were their interactions with their masters like in New York? Well... Interestingly enough, enslavement in, the, in colonial America was, was basically what we would call Atlantic colonial enslavement. There wasn't a lot of difference between North and South. If the differences at all were really based on population demographics. There were more cities in the North, so there was much more of an urban enslaved population here, whereas in the South, farmland uh, enabled for a larger plantations than in the North. But in terms of living conditions and labor, Phillipsburg Manor was a provisioning plantation. 23 enslaved men, women, and children here had, uh, according to the inventory, a probate inventory taken here in 1750, there was a building on the property labeled the Negro House. So there would have been living conditions off outside of the home of, of the Phillipses. Many of the tenant farmers here that may have owned one or two individuals, those individuals would have probably stayed in the same house as their owners, perhaps uh, in the garret or perhaps in a basement of some sort or another. You mentioned that you interpret Phillipsburg Manor in about 1750 and Van Cortlandt Manor in about 1800. What exactly can we see when we tour these two manor estates? Both being um, sort of historic sites. Uh, we have an opportunity to bring visitors through these these living museums, in a sense, and give them a sense of life at that time period. It's almost an immersive kind of experience. At Phillipsburg Manor, there are four buildings to explore, plus about 20 acres of grounds. The manor house itself is an original building, goes back to about 1685. And visitors will uh, go through the house that is decorated with uh uh, artifacts in uh, in these period rooms, but there are also rooms that are what we call touchable rooms, rooms that have reproductions. Uh, there was a large uh, dairy uh, at the, in the basement of that house, and those objects in the dairy, uh, we uh, allow visitors to interact with them, get people an understanding of what it was to make butter uh, in the middle of the 18th century. And our grist mill is a wonderful opportunity. It's a functional, mid-18th century, water-powered grist mill where visitors can enter into that building and see uh, and literally feel and even hear how grain was turned into flour in the 18th century. It's one of the most technologically advanced machines of its time period. I would love to talk about Washington Irving. Sunnyside, the residents of Washington Irving, represents another historic site that Historic Hudson Valley cares for. Would you tell us more about the man who lived at Sunnyside, who some historians and biographers have even called 
the first great American writer. Sure. I like Washington Irving, too. Everybody, anybody who comes here can, kind of develops a soft spot for this guy. Uh, Washington Irving uh, is, is a, a known basically today as, a, as the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He is known even uh, lesser today for uh, writing Rip Van Winkle. Uh, but Washington Irving, uh, in his day, was both an author and an historian. He fancied himself as much of a historian as he did a uh, short story writer. Irving was born in New York City uh, at the very end of the American Revolution in 1783 and uh, grew up in this area, visited uh, this region of Sleepy Hollow as a teenager. Uh, he had very close friends up here with the Paulding family and stayed here for summers. And I believe that's what got him interested in sort of the mysteries of this part of the Tappan Zee area. Uh, lots of old Dutch stories that would creep up and it would be something that he hit himself upon. Irving became a writer at a very young age. He had older brothers who all took the professions of being doctors and lawyers and politicians. So uh, his family sort of indulges him and allows him to become a writer. Uh, and he pursues that uh, with vigor in his early 20s, really, uh, writing under a series of different pseudonyms and publishing satires and small short stories in local New York newspapers. Uh, and he publishes his first major work at the age of 26 called uh, The History of New York, written under the pseudonym of Diedrich Knickerbocker, which is a wonderful satire. It's certainly no history uh, by any means, but it is a, a very interesting major work that helps really define define the idea of what New York is to many people. Would you tell us more about Diedrich Knickerbocker's History of New York and what inspired Irving to write it? Because that work, along with Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, really influences the way we continue to think about the Hudson Valley and its history. Yeah, it certainly does. The History of New York was published, as I said, under the pseudonym of Diedrich Knickerbocker in 1809. Irving is 26 years old. He has written several little pieces prior to this and uh, and really is much of a, a political satirist. The history of New York itself is really a political satire on the politics of 1809. It's just he dresses it all up using people like Peter Stuyvesant and Willem Kieft as stand-ins for contemporary politicians. This is a time period when America now has political factions. Uh, we have uh, we have Thomas Jefferson and the, the Democratic Republicans on one side, and we have people like Alexander Hamilton uh, and the Federalists on the other side. And so there's a lot of mudslinging going on. This is politics, and it's a dirty business. Irving's family was very much involved in uh, with uh, Aaron Burr. Uh, saw themselves as um, as Democratic Republicans that way. The Irving sort of straddled the fence a little bit uh, and could also chum up to the Federalists. In fact, Irving's neighbors here was uh, the widow of uh, Alexander Hamilton. So he got to know the Hamilton family very well, uh, in spite of his family being Burrites. So Irving writes the history of New York as a way to really discuss the political factions of 1809 politics. Although he sets it in the old Dutch New York, anybody who is reading his history of New York at that time period understands very well that this is political satire and it is very contemporary in spite of its sort of historic setting. The other work that really influences how we view the Hudson Valley is The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is a short story. An Ichabod Crane, school teacher from Connecticut, comes in to bring education and culture to these what New Englanders consider backwards Dutch inhabitants. And of course, this plays into the bigger picture of history, which is when the post-revolution New England migration occurs and 700 to 800,000 New Englanders move into New York. Could you tell us more about the legend of Sleepy Hollow and what Irving's views are of the old Dutch inhabitants who live in the Hudson Valley? Sure. The legend of Sleepy Hollow was actually published uh, as part of Irving's second major work, uh, which was in 1819, uh, a new pseudonym he comes up with this time. Uh, it is, uh, the book was called The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon. Now, Irving writes the sketchbook while he is in Europe. He had uh, gone to Europe around 1815 to help out the family business. Learning point here, never send a writer to help out with the family business because it immediately sort of went under. Uh, and Irving finds himself sort of stranded with his brother in England, and he tours Europe listening to short stories, listening to folk tales and fables, and these are all sort of becoming very popular in, in Europe in the, the early 
19th century sort of post-Napoleon sort of era and nationalism is starting to kind of creep in and such. So everybody's sort of holding tight to their own histories and their own folk tales. So he listens to these stories and he, he adapts them or comes up with new ones for America. Irving is given credit as being sort of the first American, uh, the first American to kind of develop an American legacy, an American ideology. Uh, he kind of comes up with these ideas of these old American stories, even though they're fairly new. And the Legend of Sleepy Hollow falls right into that. He sets it in this kind of creepy, sort of backwards, sort of quiet and sleepy area of uh, Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. Uh, he brings in this modern teacher from Connecticut who is going to impart not only wisdom, but also he's going to break people from all of their spooks and haunts. And, of course, Ichabod Crane is every bit as superstitious uh, as these, uh, these, these Dutch uh, people that he's uh, entering into. Uh, he carries with him Cotton Mather's book on the Salem witch trials and such. So Irving is probably making a, a commentary here that everybody sort of has their own sort of superstitions and backgrounds that uh, they may or may not want to uh, sort of admit to. Uh, so it's a fascinating story to read on a number of different levels. There's a television show called Sleepy Hollow. Is any of that filmed at Historic Hudson Valley? Does any of that really relate to Washington Irving's books? Well, to be honest, I, I haven't seen much more than a few minutes of the uh, television show. It is, uh, it, it is not filmed around here. I believe it's actually filmed in North Carolina. So they're trying to make do with some rural setting down there uh, as a stand-in. And I do know that it uh, it plays very, very loosely with the story. There is a man apparently on a horse that has no head, uh, but there is a lot more different kinds of witches and goblins and superstitions that Irving doesn't really bring up at all in his book. So it's very much a, a contemporary adaptation of the story. But the idea that this is an American story, and as Irving wrote that story, he writes it with... Well, he leaves the ending kind of open. He trusts his reader to come up with a plausible ending or a some type of an ending itself. Did Was there actually uh, a headless horseman? Was Brom Bones trying to scare off Ichabod Crane? What is this ending? It's never really tied up uh, with an answer. And I think that allows authors and writers and screenwriters and what have you to constantly reinvent that story to fit the contemporary notions of the time that they are writing it in. The Walt Disney cartoon from the 1940s adapted it one way. The Tim Burton movie with Johnny Depp adapted it a different way. And now we've got the television show uh, that is adapting it, you know, a third way to sort of tell its own story. It's really a timeless tale in some ways, a timeless American tale, if you will. It is very much so, and I would imagine that in another 10 or 15 years, somebody else is going to have a new spin on that story. When we come to visit Sunnyside, what will we see? What does Sunnyside tell us about Washington Irving? Sunnyside was Washington Irving's only home as a grown-up. He had traveled extensively in Europe. He had lived off of you know friends and family as he was there. And as he comes back home from Europe, he spent 17 years in Europe becoming quite the celebrity in Europe as well. Uh, he comes back to New York in 1832 as a mature man. He's, he's no kid anymore, about 50 years old. And he decides he's going to settle down and retire uh, in, in this area that he knew about as a teenager, this, this Tappan Zee region that he had set the story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He wants to get out of New York. New York is growing exponentially at this point and uh, wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle. So he sets up Sunnyside as his retirement home, uh, and it turns out that he never really retires. He writes all sorts of different, he continues to write while he's here at Sunnyside. He thinks that he's way out of the way up here, but within 10 years of moving in, the railroad comes through, right through his front, basically his front yard, looking out over the Hudson River. And instantly now he can realize that he can get in and out of New York City in about an hour each way, doesn't have to stay over can meet with his publisher and can come home and still retire at home. Uh, he has uh, sort of the best of both worlds, and Irving really introduces this region of Westchester uh, to become the very first sort of bedroom community of New York, the first suburb, so to speak. And other wealthier uh, New Yorkers begin to move up to this region as well to be both around Irving and also to be away from you know, diseases and sickness that's uh, inherent in the city. 
Let's take our conversation about Washington Irving into the time warp. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if Washington Irving had not written Knickerbocker's History of New York, Rip Van Winkle, or The Legend of Sleepy Hollow? Would the way we remember the Hudson Valley, its Dutch inhabitants, and the history of New York State be different? And if so, how? Ooh, wow. Well, the first thing I think would happen is the phone would go dead. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we would have a historic Hudson Valley to work at if we didn't have Washington Irving stories uh, to make this region enticing enough. That was very interesting. Let me see. If we didn't have Irving uh, and those stories... Well, we'd lose a lot. First of all, we would lose references to New York. We would lose the term Gotham as a reference to New York because Irving coins that uh, in his books. We would also learn, sort of lose the term Knickerbocker, to, which is associated with this region, which means we'd lose a basketball team, we would lose a beer, uh, and we would lose every street, uh, third street in uh, each of these towns around here as well. But more than that, I mean, more than just the snarky answer here, I think... I think America would lose something without these stories because Irving gives a very young America at this time its own cultural identity. He created American icons. He didn't create just sort of copies of Europeans' icons as well. And that's very important for a new nation that's just struggling to find itself. He also gives this young country respect. Europeans enjoyed reading Washington Irving. He was very popular uh, throughout much of Europe. And Irving becomes the first American artist to enjoy some sort of respect from Europeans. So Europeans saw this young America as a nation of farmers, as a nation of workers, laborers, but not as a nation of culture or artists or anything to that effect. We take for granted today that America produces tremendous amounts of art and culture. But at that time period, this was something brand new, and Irving is the person that Europe takes seriously. So what that does, I guess if we spin the wheel forward here on the time warp, is Irving makes it easier for the next generation of writers and artists to be even more creative in what they're doing. Would the transcendentalists have been able to write in their style if it wasn't for Irving who came ahead of them? Would Walt Whitman have to forego writing Leaves of Grass and write sonnets instead just to prove that he is a poet that can actually uh, write in a European way to basically convince a skeptical Europe that America can write sonnets and poetry rather than the way that Walt Whitman wrote. It's interesting. Without Irving, we're going to be losing a lot without his art and his influences on people like Charles Dickens and later on Mark Twain as well. I don't even want to think of a world uh, where we're not going to have Dickens and Twain to fall back on. And I think a lot of this has to do with Irving's sort of pioneering influence uh, in developing American art and, and respect as American artists. It's a good thing he wrote those tales because our literary and art history of the United States would be completely different if he hadn't, it sounds like. I mean, you know, if we, if we don't end up having an Irving and we don't end up having a Walt Whitman to experiment in poetry, then what do we do? We lose Kerouac later. We lose Bob Dylan after Kerouac. You know, uh, what, if we don't have the self-confidence to be, you know, America, the country that's willing to experiment and explore, maybe we don't find a cure for polio. Maybe we don't land a man on the moon, you know, if we really want to spin it out. Throughout our conversation, you mentioned six different historic sites that Historic Hudson Valley cares for. I think you've really enticed us to come out for a visit. Are there any special events that the organization celebrates or does it offer any teacher workshops that we should be aware of? We offer a plethora of uh, different types of events, both historically based events. Uh, coming up in another couple of weeks, we have an event at Phillipsburg Manor called Pinkster. Now, Pinkster is the Dutch word for Pentecost. We don't let it fall necessarily on the 50th day after Easter. But our Pinkster program is sort of an incorporated program historically, uh, in that it, it celebrates now an African-American celebration of spring. We know in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, 
uh, even as early as the early 19th century, Hingster was sort of co-opted by the African-American communities in Brooklyn, Manhattan, all the way up to Albany, uh, as a way to, to celebrate spring within the enslaved community and sort of took it over from the Dutch origins of what Pinkster used to be. Uh, throughout the entire month of May, every uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have an evening exhibit, it's sort of a, an event called Lightscapes up at Van Cortlandt Manor. Uh, Lightscapes uses, ooh, I don't know, tens of thousands of uh, colored lights throughout the landscape of Van Cortlandt Manor, lit up at nighttime for this springtime spectacular. It is really something to see. If you haven't been up here, you can look at us on the web at hudsonvalley.org, give you that information about lightscapes. Um, October, we kind of own October up here because of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And uh, we have events like the great jack-o'-lantern blaze up at Van Cortlandt Manor, which uh, is an artistic landscape sculpture uh, using... Um, using about 5,000 or more hand-carved pumpkins throughout the site to make uh, delicious different types of shapes and sort of a, a interesting walkway uh, as you go through the landscape. So there's always events going on here at Historic Hudson Valley um, at various sites during the daytime uh, and also these sort of bigger, uh, large-scale, landscape-based events that go on at night. I imagine the autumn is a great time to visit Historic Hudson Valley, too, because I, I imagine you have wonderful foliage. Yeah, color is something we're not lacking uh, in the fall time, absolutely. October is probably our most popular month visitation-wise for adult groups and bus groups that come through. Sunnyside is a landscaped, um, is really a landscaped historic site. Washington Irving fancied himself as an am, uh, sort of an amateur landscape designer. Uh, so you'll see much of the same landscape here that Irving had designed uh, in the 1830s and 40s. And the view across the Tappan Zee from, from Sunnyside is just spectacular in the fall with uh, um, the Palisades and the hillsides on the other end just sort of on fire uh, with color at that point. Where is the best place to look for more information about Historic Hudson Valley, its collection of historic sites, and how we can best plan our visit? Well, uh, first place to start would be at our website. Uh, then you can kind of branch off from there. But our website is www.hudsonvalley.org. We are a nonprofit organization. You can see all of our different sites on the web. We have background information about each of the, uh, the historic buildings, uh, as well as a page that deals with all of our events, uh, and also a page that you can dig a little deeper in looking at our education and some of the background history to, uh, to each of the sites as well. And I'll include a link to Historic Hudson Valley in the show notes page for this episode. Michael, thank you so much for your time and for giving us a taste of the wonderful activities and historic sites that we can visit at Historic Hudson Valley. Oh, this has been wonderful, Liz. I really appreciate talking to you today. Thank you. Washington Irving garnered respect for Americans and raised American awareness about the historical significance of the Hudson Valley region by writing and telling stories. It is in large part thanks to Washington Irving that Historic Hudson Valley and its collection of historic sites exists today. Now, I have never visited Historic Hudson Valley, but after hearing Michael talk all about the organization and its sites, I can't wait to go and visit. Now I just need to convince Tim that we should do a tour of the Lower Hudson Valley. This shouldn't really be too hard, because now that I think about it, I just have to find the right pitch, as I did when I convinced him that we should go on the Northern Campaign Tour, a glorious three-day weekend when we visited Saratoga Battlefield, Hubberton Battlefield, Crown Point, and Fort Ticonderoga. Or that time I convinced Tim that we should take a cruise around Nova Scotia and down the St. Lawrence River so I could visit Grand Pre, Fortress Louisburg, and the Plains of Abraham. Of course, I'm torn. I really want to go to Historic Hudson Valley. But after speaking with Doug Bradburn in episode 33, I want to go back to Virginia, too. So also in my brain, I have this idea of a grand Virginia tour where we cover sites like Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpelier and Ashlawn Highland, which, as you know, are the historic homes of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison and James Monroe. I guess I can tell that it is late June because my mind so wants to be on vacation. How are you faring this summer? You can find information about Historic Hudson Valley, its historic sites and events, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. 
You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero three five. Okay, our big announcement. Earlier this year, I mentioned that I wanted to host a meetup to both meet you and to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act and the Boston riots that precipitated the violent protests of the American Revolution. I am happy to report that I have finally written the tour and set the final details with Boston by Foot, one of my favorite nonprofit history organizations here in Boston and the organization that I have partnered with to offer this tour. The Stamp Act Tour, also known as Taxes, Riots, and Revolution Tour, will take place on Saturday, August 15th at 10.30 a.m. It will last about two hours, and it will cover the history of the Stamp Act, the Boston riots over it, as well as other aspects of the role Boston played in the American Revolution. The cost for this tour will be $17 per person, and all of the proceeds will go to benefit Boston by foot. To sign up, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. And if you would like to have me as your tour guide, be sure to type Liz into the comment box when you purchase your tickets. Speaking of having me as your tour guide, for safety reasons, I can only take 20 people in my group. So I will take the first 20 people who have signed up for the tour and type Liz into the comment box. The reason for this 20 person limit is this is an urban tour. We're going to go right into the heart of Boston downtown. We have really narrow streets and we have crazy drivers. If you haven't seen a Boston driver yet, that's worth coming up here in August just to see in and of itself. But it's okay that I can only take 20 people in my group because my fellow Boston by Foot tour docents are fantastic and there will be enough guides for everyone who wants to go on this tour to go. And I'll also hang out after the tour. I'll hang out at the very last stop. I'll wait for all the other tour groups to finish so we can say hi, really meet in person, and perhaps we can find a nice restaurant or a pub that we can go for lunch and drinks after the tour. I really hope I see you here in Boston on August 15th. I know not everybody will be able to make it, but if you can make it, I really hope to see you because I just can't wait to meet with you and share my city and its history with you. If you think I'm excited on this podcast, wait till you get me on the tour route. I promise you, we're going to have a great time. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup to discover more details about our meetup and to purchase tickets for the Taxes, Riots, and Revolution Tour. Finally, what interesting historic sites have you visited and really enjoyed? Email me your answers, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>